Let us pray. As your word is opened to us, O God, let us hear what you want us to hear so that we might be who you want us to be and do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our second reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Let us listen together for God's word to us. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our home was built in 1958, and the kitchen in our home is original, or vintage if you want to put a positive spin on it. The cabinets, the counters, a few little fixes here and there, new appliances of course, but for the most part the kitchen looks much as it did more than 60 years ago now. So when we moved into this house, there were immediately two camps. My wife was in the, we should renovate the kitchen camp, and I was in the, that will be really expensive camp, we should just live with it. And so we have just lived with it for quite a while. It has its flaws, but we have made it work. Uh, about a year ago, I had grown uh, incredibly frustrated with the rails on our silverware drawer. That drawer gets opened a couple dozen times a day. My children don't have any regard for the historical quality of our kitchen, so they, uh, they throw that thing open and they slam it shut, and anyways, those rails became really rough. They didn't slide smoothly, they were loud, and sometimes you just had to force the drawer instead of pushing it gently to close it. So I went to the hardware store and I bought new rails for the drawer, nice, heavy-duty, smooth rails, and I took half a day, because that's how long it took me, uh, to take the old rails off and put new ones on, and it, it worked beautifully. It was a masterpiece. It was quiet, it was smooth, it closed, it opened. It was perfect the way that it should be. And I said to my wife, see, we can live with this kitchen. We can, we can make it work. And a few months later, the drawer would stand open about an inch, sometimes, when it wanted to. It didn't close all the way, sometimes. Most of the time it was all right. And then it was always open about an inch. And then it was sometimes open about three inches and other times just an inch. And before you knew it, the drawer was all the way out all the time. And it didn't matter how hard we pushed the darn thing in, it would not stay in. I think what I probably did was I didn't have the rails level, so it was on a slightly downward tilt. Uh, gravity uh, being what it is, just pulled the drawer out. And that for me... After all the effort and frustration that that had caused me, that was the last straw for the kitchen. I joined Kristen in the we should probably renovate camp. Although I'm still in the this would be really expensive camp too. I'm sort of in both worlds. But I had decided that because of how frustrating that piece was, that the kitchen just has too many problems. And it's time to just give up. There is a way of telling the Christian story that is a lot like the story of my kitchen. We look out at the world and there are so many problems. So many problems. Too many things to fix. It's just time to give up. And on this telling of the Christian story, the world is where we live but it's not really the primary arena of God's concern. The world is ultimately disposable. It's beyond hope. It's, it's without hope. In fact, it doesn't even really need hope because God's going to do away with it eventually. In 1493 in Germany, shortly after the invention of the printing press, 
An encyclopedia of history was created. We call it the Nuremberg Chronicle, and it's a chronicle of history from creation through the ages of history to the present age. It separates it all out into six ages, and the sixth age is this present age. And it has a very dim outlook on the present. It talks about the calamity of our time. You get the sense from this document that there was very little vision, very little hope for the world. In fact, the authors, the creators of this encyclopedia left several blank pages at the end so that future readers could, and I quote, add the rest of the events until the end of the world. So dim was their outlook, so thin was their hope for the world that they figured that the people who came after them would need only a few pages to describe the rest of the events until everything came to an end. It was a world without hope. A Christian civilization that was convinced that God would soon have no more use for the world. On this particular telling of the Christian story, God's primary work is facilitating our evacuation from the world. And of course, the book of Revelation provides us with rich source material for this outlook. Talk of Armageddon and the war of the Lamb and bulls and horns and trumpets heralding the, the pouring out of God's wrath upon the world. It puts us in the same frame of mind as those medieval Europeans who thought the story had almost been done being told that it was almost over and we needed only a few pages. It's a world without hope. A world that doesn't really need hope because God would soon have no use for the world anyway. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we will acknowledge that there are some things about this story, this way of telling the story, that are really tempting, really compelling to us, especially when we look out at the world and we see that there is so much more that's going wrong than what's going right. The problems that we have at home and abroad are just too big. They're intractable. They're, they're not being resolved. In fact, most of them just seem to be getting worse, not better. So it's tempting to think that all along, God's purpose has been leading to some cosmic cleanup job. That God is going to come in and dole out divine reward and divine punishment to finally settle the scores, to make everything right, because this broken world is so uneven. And we're just waiting for that cleanup job to come around. If we have secured our own escape, then we can stop worrying about the world and all of its problems. Of course, we can stop working to solve them as well. We can turn inward. We can shut our ears. We can close our eyes. We can imagine that we have absolutely no part in what happens out there. There are too many things wrong with the world. It's time to give up. And that is, of course, the wrong way to tell the Christian story. We often talk about love as the center of the Christian faith. Now, love is important. Love is really, really important. But you've probably heard me say before that love is not the heart of Christianity, hope. Hope is the heart of the Christian faith. The story of God from beginning to end is a story of hope. It's a story of broken things being mended. It's a story of wounded things being healed, of uh, abandoned things being embraced. It's a story of scattered things being made whole again. This is the movement, the motion that the story of God is in. All of the momentum of history, all of the momentum of God's work in the world is moving in this direction and it catches everything up in it, with it, with that momentum, not just my immortal soul, but the world and everything that is in it is a part of this story. It's a part of the movement of God in the world. Isaiah says, no more shall there be an infant who lives but a few days, or, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not hurt or destroy 
on all my holy mountain. Here is the promise of the prophet. The world is not without hope. The world is broken, but the world will not always be the way the world is. And this promise is confirmed at the end. At the very end, the end of the end, in revelation of all places, the confirmation of this promise, of God's ultimate purpose, is confirmed. See, I am making all things new. In the mid-1980s, there was a 14-acre plot of land that stood vacant in the heart of south-central Los Angeles, a neighborhood well-known at the time for its crime and its violence, and its poverty. There's this empty lot, big, empty lot. And the businesses that had been there had long been torn down. So this land was filled with, you know, the concrete debris of foundations and the sort of things that accumulate over time in an abandoned lot in a crowded city. Well, in the mid-80s, the city of Los Angeles decided that it needed to build an incinerator. And it thought that this plot of land in a neighborhood filled with warehouses and run-down apartment buildings and poor people. They thought this was the perfect place to build their incinerator. So the city of Los Angeles expropriated the land with eminent domain, paid $5 million to the various property owners uh, who had title to that land, though one company in particular held more than three-quarters of it. And then the fight began. Because the people of that neighborhood did not want an incinerator in their neighborhood. They started to protest. They built steam. They built energy around this movement. And six years later, in 1992, the incinerator had not yet been built, and the city of Los Angeles finally agreed to change their plan. And so what they did was they gave the land to the Los Angeles Food Bank. And the food bank gave the land to the neighborhood. And that's when the people got to work. These marginalized people, these mostly propertyless people, they walked from their houses and apartments. After a, a long day of hard work, they walked to this plot of land that was now theirs. And they began the meticulous and arduous task of cleaning it up, of picking up all that debris, and then clearing the land, and then carting in themselves and raking themselves fertile, rich soil so that they could transform that 14-acre land into a garden. And 10 years later, that garden was a beautiful patchwork of green and brown, of fruit and vegetables. It was the country's largest urban garden at the time. They even had an organizational structure to manage the garden. The garden was so big, it was divided into sections, and each section had a council person that served on a council specifically for this garden. It was the people of the community coming together and creating something together. And so many of these folks were of Mexican and Mesoamerican descent, and they had histories, they had generations of land cultivation in their family, and they brought that experience and that expertise. And at its peak, this garden had more than 150 different species of fruits and vegetables and herbs and medicinal plants. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. Here is a people with hope. With hope for their community. With hope for the world around them. A hope that drives them not only to envision a different world, but to work to make that different world a reality. Now they're not transforming the world. They're not solving global problems. They're not conquering systemic issues of injustice. They're just transforming 14 acres in South Central Los Angeles. They're demonstrating the kind of hope that is embedded in the Christian story, that is woven throughout the story of God from start to finish. It's the story of God's care for the world, not just you and me, but for the world and everything that is in it. 
and these people and their land, they are all caught up in the momentum, the movement of God's work in the world. Now we can look at the world today and we can tell ourselves one of two stories about the world we see. We can tell ourselves that the world is none of our concern. We can tell ourselves that the problems are too big and too many. And pretty soon God won't have any use for this world anyways. Now you can call that story whatever you like, but don't call it the Christian story. That is not the story of God at work in the world. That story is to look at the world and to have hope. To look at the world and have hope. The story of the South Central Farm does not have a happy ending. One of the owners of these companies that had previously owned the land, the one who owned more than three quarters of the land, filed a claim with the city of Los Angeles. Since the city changed their plans for how the land was supposed to be used, he argued that he had a right to buy the property back. And eventually, he did. He won that claim. And he bought the property back for just a little bit more than $5 million. So more or less what the city had bought the land for. Now the people of the neighborhood wanted to keep their garden. And so they fought with that property owner. It was a bitter fight. They wanted to buy the land from him, and he relented, and he offered it to them for $16 million. Well, at this point, this had become quite a cause for many, including a lot of charitable organizations. And so this neighborhood in South Central LA had a lot of firepower to bring to bear on this fight, a lot of fundraising power, and they got to that point where they had $16 million committed and they offered to buy the land and the property owner said no. He declined. And a short time after that, the LA County Sheriff came in along with a crew of people and this crew demolished the garden it down, put up a fence around the perimeter of the property. And at the time that the author who, who relays this story had written his book that I'm drawing from, seven years after this demolition, there's still a perimeter fence around that lot in South Central LA. And every now and then the city comes out with a lawnmower and cuts it down so it doesn't get overgrown. Now a scar in the middle of that community. So perhaps you're wondering why I have shared this with you as a story of hope. A story of hope should have a happy ending, right? This is, in fact, a story of hope. It is a reminder to us of the power that hope has in our lives and in the world around us. It's a reminder of what can happen when we have hope for the world and let that hope shape what we do and who we are. It's a reminder of what can happen when we embrace the vision of the prophet, the vision of revelation, and begin to make that vision real. It's a reminder of what can happen when we decide that there's not too much wrong, that it's not time to give up. We may not have hope so strong as to imagine an end to all of the world's problems, but we do have enough hope for 10 years and 14 acres. We do have enough hope for Milford, Michigan. Maybe we have enough hope for the Huron Valley community. Maybe we have enough hope for Oakland County, for Metro Detroit. We certainly have enough hope to decide that the world is the Lord's and everything in it. We certainly have enough hope to set aside the lie that the world is none of my concern. We certainly have enough hope to trust that God is working to make all things new and to join in the work. Let us pray. God, our hope is often weak, but for you it is enough. Cultivate that hope in us, a hope that extends beyond our own lives and out into the world, 
a hope that drives us into the world to see your vision of all things made new, made real in small ways around us all the time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.